Hello. As someone who has been talking about and exposing destructive cult abuses for the last few years, I am contacted all the time by people who want to share their stories with me. Many times, they're just looking for a sympathetic and understanding ear. Someone who gets what they've been through and just needs to be told that no, they're not crazy, and yes, what they went through really was so insane that most people would probably have a hard time understanding it. I get these on an almost daily basis from former or even active members of very diverse groups all over the world, not just from ex-Scientologists. Not all of these stories sound as salacious or outlandish as what we often see on TV. Leah Remini gets it right in Scientology and the Aftermath on A&E. But some of these other TV shows and news featurettes don't always pay attention or understand their own story well enough to report accurately on all the facts. This can sometimes leave people with the idea that members of destructive cults always get sexually and physically abused or that they stalk and try to murder everyone who ever leaves. This kind of hyperbole isn't helpful in the fight against these abusive groups, because not everyone has the same experience. However, almost uniformly what you do find in talking to former members of these groups are intense feelings of shame and guilt. The idea that they were the ones at fault because they couldn't measure up to the cult's impossible standards and ideals. They are traumatized and psychologically scarred, but have been indoctrinated that everything that happened to them was their fault because they weren't good enough or strong enough or pure enough. They are gaslighted by being told that things which definitely happened to them didn't really happen, that they either remember it wrong or are corrupting their own memories in order to make the cult look bad because they are just spiritual or moral failures. This kind of behavior all by itself is reason enough to run, not walk away from any such group. It's not just what's done to a person that makes a cult destructive. It's also what's taken away from them. When real physical or sexual abuse is piled on top of that, you have an obvious case of abusive or even criminal behavior, and we highlight those stories so people can easily understand why these groups are out of control and need to be regulated in some way. Recently, I was contacted by a former second-generation Scientologist who lives right here in Denver named Kat McElhaney. For 18 years, she has been dealing with the guilt and shame of her brief but impactful experience with Scientology as a young teenager and the fact that her mother remains a Scientologist despite her efforts to talk to her about the abuse Kat experienced. It's not any fun and it certainly doesn't bring any monetary gain to speak out against destructive cults like Scientology, but it definitely can be liberating. I therefore wanted to give Kat a chance to tell her story. For her, this is the story of some horrible experiences during the formative years of her life which she has been burdened with for far too long. For us, this is another of the thousands of survivor stories we need to hear and be reminded of so we know that yes, this does go on right here in the United States, fully sanctioned and supported by our government and legal system under the misbegotten notion that freedom of religion is more important than freedom of life and freedom from abusive predatory behavior. The recent scandal with the Catholic Church covering up yet hundreds more cases of pedophilia within its own ranks and lobbying to prevent laws that would stop its predation only highlight that it's not just little cults like Scientology that try to get away with this. We have a lot of work to do and we cannot rest until every child in this country and around the world can grow up safe. Here's Kat. My name is Kat McElhenney. I live here in Denver. Um, yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> now, what was it that prompted you to want to tell your story and speak out about, you know, or against, I should say, Scientology? Right. Um, I guess a couple of reasons. One would be, first of all, you know, the cliche, but I do mean it. Um, 
if you can help one person with your story, then of course you want to help them by telling it. And if it helps keep another child out of the Sea Org, then that will have been worth it. Um, also, I got to tell you, it eats me up inside. So I, I need to get it out. Like I'm in the healing process of it all. It happened, I think, 18 years ago um, when I was 13. But um, I didn't start to delve into any of the trauma till very recently. So um, I, I want to get it out. I want to be able to speak my truth, speak what happened to me. Um, and also hopefully find a bit of a community also amongst ex-Scientologists because I don't really have that. And so I have many friends who are so awesome and so understanding and listen to me, but they, they just haven't been through it. And so I have to explain a lot of things to them. And I it would love to be part of a community where people just know and I can just talk freely and not have to explain a bajillion things because unless you've been in the cult, you don't know what I'm talking about. So well, that's, exactly. those are my, uh, yeah. Good. Excellent. Yeah. yeah and, and very, very true. Uh, there's, you know, it, as much as you try to explain it to other people yeah. or, you know, they watch Leah's show or they watch Going Clear or they read a book or mm -hmm. two or three or five. Right. It's hard to feel like right. you totally get. Right. And then also like to explain one scenario, then you have to like define 1200 acronyms and all this stuff so that they understand what you're talking about. And so yeah, to have that community where you can be like, just say what you're saying and they understand. Like when we got together for lunch, that was great that we just talked. I knew what you were saying, you know what I was saying. And it was, it was good. So, exactly. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and start from the beginning. Okay. So I grew up in Calgary, Alberta. Um, and uh, we were actually Mormon for the first 10 years of my life. I know it went on longer um, for my siblings who are older than me. Um, I don't think I got that before. It, yeah, I don't I, think or, I or mentioned kind of that. kind of gone over my uh, head. You were raised, raised Mormon. LDS. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, raised Mormon. Um, my dad was a big, was big into it. Um, into the Mormon church, and um, he was kind of the driving force that kept us in it. Um, but unfortunately, when I was 10 years old, um, he unexpectedly died. Um, we had no idea he, he was sick. He ended up having cancer, um, and he had, the, the autopsy report said he had, his left lung was obliterated by tumors, but he was the kind of guy that you just ignore pain. You go to work, you just ignore it, and so he totally ignored terminal cancer, and um, we celebrated his 42nd birthday on August 29th, and then came home from school August 30th, um, and my mom's friend was there instead of my mother, which was the first clue that something was wrong, and she told me that my father was in the hospital, um, that he was having trouble breathing, and um, um, my mom just came home that night, um, several hours later, and took us all, all six of us kids into the family room and told us that he had died. And um, so it was very unexpected. We didn't, did not see that coming. So as a result of that, um, I got debilitating panic attacks. I was so worried my mother was either gonna die or ab abandon us. Like she couldn't leave the room without like my chest getting really tight and I would have to go see what she was doing and, and make sure she wasn't about to leave. Um, and so this went on for about like a year or so, I want to say. How old were you at the time? Uh, so I was 10 at the time. Um, and then when I was 11, uh, my mom's friend told her about this great, wonderful thing called Scientology. Um, and she said that it's helped her with so many problems and, um, you know, the spiel that you get, I guess. And my mom... I was like, okay, well, I'd like to check that out. And then she thought of me because I was just a wreck and had all these panic attacks all the time, that maybe they could, could help me with that. And her friend said that they could help me with that. So um, when I was 11, I was 11 at this point, um, my mom booked passage to LA from Canada and we went to Celebrity Center and got on lines there. Okay. So, yeah. And you have a, a number of brothers and sisters. I do. I have four brothers and one sister. Okay. How are they dealing with the loss? Were there any other similar effects with them, or did you kind of stand out a bit with this in this regard? Right. I think, I mean, they were all grieving, and it was a hard time, but I was the one that was having, like, the most 
physical of a reaction, I guess. Okay. And I'm sure I was driving my mom insane. Like, seriously, she could not leave a room without me being like, where are you going? You coming back, huh? Like, mm. it was, it was really bad. Okay. So. So when she got this opportunity to, what she thought was an opportunity. Correct. Go to Los Angeles, find out about this Scientology right. stuff. Right. Why Los Angeles, by the way? Was it, wasn't there anything in mm, your... No, nothing in, nothing in Alberta. I'm not sure about the rest of Canada. But um, I believe my mom's friend was on lines at CC, and so it just made sense that, yeah, go to CC. Okay. So. All right. And um, I'm sorry, what year was this again? Uh, good question. Let's see. I was 11, so 1997. And was your... Uh, friend was your mother's friend a celebrity how was it that she connected up with celebrities she was not a celebrity I actually don't know that I don't know what, okay. how she got okay I was just curious them. yeah because it's not it wasn't necessarily required uh, I, then or I, I believe now that you be a celebrity right. you know, a celebrity center right <laughs> but it was of, very much encouraged <laughs> yeah they were, you know, yeah they were celebrities all right so you show up in LA mm -hmm. 11 years old mm-hmm Scientology. Scientology. Well, first of all, like, just the idea of going on a trip alone with my mom. Like, that in itself was just like, oh my gosh, because like, there's five other siblings, so, you know, you gotta kind of fight for the attention, and so that alone was awesome, and then LA movie stars, so just the whole, like, I was just wrapped up in, like, that magic of it all. Um, was this the first time you'd been to the States? Not being to the States, no, but okay. to, to California and to LA. Okay. Um, and, uh, then you pull up to Celebrity Center, and that building is amazing. I remember, like, just being like, oh, my gosh, it's this castle, and, like, the grounds are beautifully manicured, and everything just smells right, and it's just, I don't know. I was very taken by the building. It was very, a very magical experience, and, um, yeah. All right, well, how long were you there the first time? <sighs> I would like to say a week or two. I would, I would probably say a week. I'm not quite sure. Okay, and you got some Scientology auditing? Right, so I got some auditing. Um, like, I think it was the second day that we were there. We went down to some part of CC, and then they separated us, which, I mean, I'm having panic attacks, and they separate me from my mom when I'm in a different country. <laughs> and so I remember just sitting on the couch like, okay, I'm just going to be homeless in L.A., and I'm just going to have to make it work. And that was my thought process. Um, and then finally my auditor came and got me, and we went back to the room. And um, I, I believe it took uh, one or two sessions, but it it cleared up my panic attacks. Like, it released me from that. It was actually kind of amazing because it had been something that was so debilitating. Um, and then to just have them gone was captivating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated by that. And this is one of those cases where we can see that there was something wrong. And right. then, you know, this is one of those cases where Scientology actually managed right. to do something good. Right. Do you recall what it was that you got auditing on or how that was addressed? I know it was a long time ago. I do not recall. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of earlier similar questions asked but other than that I don't recall what it was ah, no problem yeah I was just curious yeah all right so that was probably a pretty good result I mean were you guys was your mother happy were you happy Did yeah it... yeah we were all happy that was like awesome like that's magic right there so the, we were hooked at that point like the, there's something to this um I don't know if me or my mother knew the extent of science well we definitely didn't know like that it was a religion and like um, how much you would have to put into it at the time but just that little bit of like I got auditing I didn't have panic attacks anymore that was enough to be like okay well let's let's look more into this because there's something there right yeah okay cool so then you went back home mm -hmm. um, and then when did you, like life carried on and when did you go back to LA what, what happened? Um, I believe I was 12 maybe it was the following year that I went back and my um older brother actually ended up coming and he did the purif um while we were there and I think I did communication and grammar course I think it was okay yeah all right cool and uh that was the whole trip that time I believe so 
Okay, you don't recall any other services or anything? No, not for myself. I know my mom did like the student hat and I think she did some auditing. But, okay. Yeah. All right. And this was, was this the only time that she was doing Scientology? Correct. But yeah, this was our, These really trips. our only involvement. Like, cause we, yeah, when we went back home, we didn't have any Scientologist friends except for the one. Um, it's not like we were around her all the time, but it was definitely like compartmentalized away and it wasn't a way of life that we had. It was just this thing that we did in LA. Right. All right. And when you were back in Canada, mm -hmm. um, 12, 13 years old now, mm -hmm. I suppose, were you hearing anything about Scientology? No. Otherwise? No. No. Nobody knew anything about it. I would try to explain it and I'd be like, okay, oh, whatever. It's just this thing that we do. You know, it's a study of technology or whatever. That whole thing is breaking down the word Scientology and... Um, yeah, but that that was about it. All right. Yeah. So then, what happened the next time you went down to LA? Ugh. And and the when cursed what? third trip. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, so we went down. Um, I believe this week was, or this was going to be a two week trip. Um, and I was going to do the key to life course, and I actually started on it. Um, doing that damn clay table auditing. Um. And that, that was all going fine. Um, had a twin we were auditing. And then one day, um, a couple of days into the trip, uh, me and my mother were sitting at the Rose Garden Cafe. And like I get, would get this like sparkling soda. It might have just been soda because all soda is sparkling. But it was only, could only get it in the States. And it was so amazing. And so I was apparently very captivated by it. But sitting there drinking one and just talking with my mother about who knows. Um, and then this one, um, woman, probably like 19, 20 came up to me and she's like, would you like to come watch a movie? And I was like, sure. I like movies. Like, yeah. Um, so we go downstairs to the basement and they set us up in this like little, like home theater kind of situations. It's very nice. Again, like very high value, um, or high quality rather. And, um, and you and your mother both were there. Yes. Um, and so she turns the movie on starts talking about the Sea Org and how great it is. And I was like, oh, cool. Thanks for like this. That's cool that they do this, you know? Um, and then I believe it's the movie where that one guy's like, you, what is it? You could watch this movie and you could walk away. Um, that would be stupid. You could also go jump off a cliff. Oh, okay. Now, okay. So let's differentiate. Oh, so, okay. Because I'm not sure. Because there's the there are a movie called Orientation. Okay. Which walks you through the what Scientology is. It starts with an asteroid field and this weird. Oh music yeah. Okay. So I'm yeah. I am switching those two movies up. That's okay. right. Yeah. And then yeah. And then there's the thing I believe you saw, which was this called the Sea Org slideshow. Okay. Now I don't want to put words in your mouth. Right. But usually when they're trying to in, trying to get people to join the Sea Org, they'll show them this slideshow. Okay. Which is narrated by Jason Begay, oh, or at least it used to be. Right. Right. We live in a world gone mad. Yes, that's it. Yes. So that's that how it is it. Yes. Okay, good. So that's that's called the Sea Org slideshow. Okay. But she's like, okay, well, can you come back tonight? And I was like, yeah, sure, I guess. And like, I, I'm a people pleaser, like. If, especially back then, you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. Um, so even though I didn't want to, I came back that night, minus my mother. And then the recruitment cycle started. And it was pretty pretty heavy and intense for a couple of days. And, and Well, what sort of things do you remember them saying to you? Uh, a lot of, um, you know, Scientology is the only way this plant's going to get better. Um, you need to help, you need to be a part of this process, like now you know about it, so you have to um, join the Sea Org and clear the planet. Just heavy and hard, and that at, at one point, um, a security guard, um, but he joined in on the, on the recruiting, so there was two of them against me, um, and just a couple of days of just hounding me, breaking me down, and I, I wish I could remember more. I really do. Sure. But I, but I don't. Well, do you remember uh, meeting with your mother at all, like maybe during meal times, or was there any sort of like explaining to her what was happening? Was she curious about what they were talking to you about all day long? 
Or was she just kind of off doing her auditing? Off, off in her own what? little world, I believe. I could be incorrect about that, but I don't think she asked. I don't think we talked about it. Okay. Um, was she expecting that you were on course? I mean, you were there to do the keto ice. Right. I don't, I don't think she was super interested in what I was doing or that okay. wasn't her focus and attention at the time. Well, she was also, I don't know if it was this trip or the trip before, I think it was the trip before, um, she got regged to crap. She had gotten a large sum of money from my father's life insurance and spent a large sum of that money donating it. She got time at the manor. She got um, two, two e-meters because you can't have just one. She had barely done any Scientology. Um, she paid for a bunch of courses. Um, so she was regged out of a whole lot of money. So I don't know if that was happening then or what, if she was... Yeah, just dealing with her own stuff. But okay. from what I can remember, she did not ask, and we did not talk about it. All right. I was I was only surprised because the Keto Life course all by itself is $5,000. Ooh. So to pay for that for your daughter is quite generous. I would imagine she would... I mean, if I was the parent, I would have been quite interested in what your progress yeah. on course. Yeah. No kidding. 5000 Yeah. Yeah, those books were really big. Yeah, 40 pounds of books. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a, quite, a, quite a thing. Oh, yeah. I, I supervised the Kid Life course for many years right. when I was in Santa Barbara. It's and it's, a, it's, it's quite a course, but you barely touched it. Oh, yeah. I just yeah. did the clay table auditing at the very beginning. And, right. Yeah. And which, in hindsight, came. I'm so glad I didn't have to go through that 40 pounds of book. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite, a, it's quite a course. Yeah. So um, what ended up happening? Two or three days of full-time recruitment. Mm -hmm. I do remember the security guard being there. And I, and I remember feeling like really defeated, really beat up on. Like there was these two people against me and like I'm the bad guy if I don't join the Sea Org because mankind depends on it. So what do you do with that? Like you kind of have to, right? Um, and I was 13. I was a dumb kid. Like... We do dumb things. Well, what grade were you in school-wise? Eighth grade. Okay, so they're pounding on you. You're an eighth grader, and they're talking to you about the state of the planet and how right. you're personally responsible for its condition. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. to put a little perspective <laughs> there for people. Yeah, that is Yeah, good the world rests on the shoulders of eighth graders. Right, which that would be a sad situation if that were true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be a little bit odd. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I remember the security guard, um, him sitting in there and, and again, like I said, I felt just really defeated, really beat down. There was like anything I said was just immediately put down. Like I'm 13. Oh, well your, your body's just 13. Your thing's billions of years old. So like that, like immediately squash that. Like, and anytime I brought it up, like, no, it doesn't even matter. That's not an issue you need to join the Sea Org. And, um, and so I remember the security guard being like, what is there to think about? You just want to go home and think of what is there? I, all I picture is you going home and sitting like this and just thinking about it. And I was like, well, yeah, that does sound kind of dumb. And again, eighth grade logic. Um, now I'd be like, yeah, maybe I will go home and sit in a corner and think about it. Like, that's a good idea when you're making huge life decisions. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, so eventually, like, I don't know, just the every last part of my defense broke. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And um, honestly, I was really hoping my mom would be like, you crazy? No, you cannot do that. <laughs> um, so we called her down to the room, and I even said to them, like, well, I don't know if my mom's going to let me join. And um, she was like, or they're like, it's okay, don't worry about your mom. Don't worry about your mom. I was like okay um and it was a very quick conversation as I recall maybe there was a I don't know if you should do this and I think I looked at her and said but I really want to and uh she was like oh okay and then that was that I signed the billion year contract and I was Good to go. It was good to go. So did they have you go home and pack up all your stuff oh, no, and no. say goodbye to your friends? Because I could go home and think about it then. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. I was just wondering. Yeah, no, no, it was um, my mom left and I stayed and routed onto the EPF. Okay. Yeah, you you did routed onto the Estates Project Correct. Force. Correct. Yeah, the Estates Project Force. Yeah. Okay. And briefly explain what that is. Uh, so that's basically the boot camp. 
to the Sea Org, um, you have, oh, I think it's four courses that you have to take, um, four core courses um, of LRH, thinking he knows everything that you have to sit and learn. Um, and so you have to do that five hours a day and then 10 hours a day of uh, manual labor. So whatever they needed you to do, um, you would you would have to do it. You were a peon, you were, you know, scum, and uh, had to run everywhere you went. You could not be caught walking. Um, yeah. What and kind was, of work were you doing? Um, I started off on the construction crew. So they had just bought the Bronson building across the street, um, or they were just starting to renovate it. Um, it was still really run down by the time I was there, and that's actually the building that I lived in. Um, was the Bronson and um, so I started off in my first first day there like um, we were pulling carpet off stairs and just like being thrown into this being like a normal 13 year old to pulling carpet off the stairs and you have to go super fast you have to be super human you have to be perfect period the end and yeah all right how many people were on the EPF with you Yes. Roughly 20, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. And were any of them all your age? And not at the time when I joined. There was actually, while I was there, two 11-year-olds. Okay. Yeah. Well, during the time you were on the EPF, well, yeah. they came on the EPF. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did they, do you know if they graduated and finished? And I know one graduated. Oh, you know what? And I got a letter from one of them. I really liked her, actually. Um, a couple years after I left, so... Okay. She did graduate and was still there. 11 years old. 11 years old, yeah. Awesome, building your contract. Yeah. And so the other people that you observed on the EPF were mainly adults then? Correct, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Well, I wouldn't say adults. I would say adults, teenagers. Um, oh. So, I mean, there, there was a big variety, but there was definitely people like 15, 16, 17-year-old. Oh, okay. On there while I was there. A little under half were were children like in their teens okay but older than me and then two that were younger okay yeah all right and uh how did you do in the courses not good <laughs> um and actually something just came to mind um if you don't mind me sure. rewinding just a little bit um so when i ratted on the epf um, you know, it was just a whirlwind of paperwork and aptitude tests and iq tests and all that stuff and um, I was a Canadian citizen. I was an American citizen born abroad, but Canadian citizen. Um, and I did not have a social security number. So could not legally be paid in the United States of America. So as we were going through all the paperwork and they're like, what's your social security number? And I was like, I don't have one. And, uh, like, I just remember like the room stopped and everybody was like, well, crap, what do we do? And, uh, and then this one guy who was like doing the paperwork, he's like, well, that's okay. We just won't pay you until, until you get it. Diane, you're just going to have to go home. Sorry, my mom. You're just going to have to go home and, um, and get your daughter a social security number. But we'll, you can just work for free. Nice. Not that I was going to make a lot of money anyways, but like zero income, zero anything on my own in a different country. No money, no nothing. And your mom was okay with that? And also, since I was 13, she had to sign over guardianship of me. And uh, we signed it over, she signed me over to, I want to say the has. So you had a guardian named here in the United States who was legally responsible for you. Correct, yeah. While you were on the APF, did you ever see this person? I maybe ran past her once or twice. Like I knew who she was, but she was not involved in my life, no. Like, right. it was just a technicality. Yeah, the usual paperwork sort of drug. Right, work around the laws and stuff like that. Okay, so no social security number. Mm -hmm. Nonsense guardian. Right. Your mom just signed you over and went and got on a plane. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I have to comment on the fact that that is grossly irresponsible of your mom. I would have to agree with you okay. on that comment. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, I'm not, you know, into victimizing people, but Jesus right. fucking Christ, you know. Yeah. For, yeah. Okay. For real. Um, so did you ever get a social security number? Uh, not while I was there, no. Okay. Yeah, I do have one now, but yeah, not while I was there. All right. 
And so, yeah, just working for free was just kind of no big deal. Right. Yeah. Every day, payday, or every Friday, the payday, everybody got their like $47 or something like that. And I just had to sit back and watch. All right. So how long were you on the EPF? <laughs> A long time. Seven months. Okay. Roughly. It was, it was a very long time. <laughs> now, uh, set, now, just logistically, seven months, no pay. How were you paying for socks? I mean, what did you do for I had what I had, what I brought. Um, socks and shoes and everything like that. Just what I had on, in my bag when I went to visit. Um, there was no way to replenish that. And um, toiletries, I honestly probably really smelled really bad. I didn't have any of my own, and when I had to absolutely take a shower, I would just like sneak somebody else's who left their shampoo in there. Um, yeah. Okay. And the guardian never came around to. Oh no. Help you out with this? Or no, 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 no. She never. Okay. No. I mean, people would assume. Right. That well, guardian, in that just position. the name, like guardian, like no, she was, she was not a guardian. She was a not guardian <laughs> got it yeah okay so what was the day-to-day -day of the EPF like um so you woke up I don't remember what time it's pretty early um made your bed perfectly had to have hospital corners and it had to be great um we had communal uniforms um, so they were in a different room. So you would go pick out, like you had like a t-shirt that said like a state's project force. And then this other like work shirt, blue work shirt. Um, and then blue, like dicky pants. Um, and I believe a belt, I want to say. Um, and then you went to muster. So by communal clothes, you mean clothes other people were wearing also? Right. So like you, yeah, you didn't have like, this is your uniform. It would be like, these are the smalls, these are the mediums, these are the large. Um, if it's there, great. If you don't have your size, wear the next size up. Like, okay. Yeah. And then you mentioned, uh, going to muster. Yeah. So you go to muster. Um, I believe that's what we called it, but it was basically met in the, um, garage of CC, like the underground, I believe that's where it was. I don't know if the Bronson had an underground garage, but I believe it was the CC building and the and definitely underground in a garage. Um, and you would do drills, militaristic drills. So like you would do like right face, about face and a, a 10 hut and um, drills. And then we'd have to do crazy exercises or, or team building things. Like one time we had to pull a car. I don't know if that was in the morning, but cause we had multiple musters where we had to do that, but. Pull a car. Yeah. Oh, that's a new one. I've never heard of that. Yeah. One. Yeah. He's all just get and just start dragging a car. Yeah, because nothing built. Team, yeah, yeah, it was very, thing. very teen. I felt very close to my um, EPFers after that. Okay. Thick as thieves now. So. Got it. Yeah. All right, and then what? Um, um, how did your day proceed? So then we had one hour, I believe, before breakfast, um, where we'd have to go do our morning job. So whatever unit you were in, it was broken down. Like there was one unit that cleaned. Um, the hotel, the manor hotel. So they would help the Sea Org staff or Sea Org members who were um, part of the manor um, clean the hotel rooms and whatnot. Um, there was the galley. You worked in the galley, cleaning, doing dishes. Um, I don't believe we dealt with the food. I personally didn't, but um, yeah. And then there was the construction crew. Um, yeah, working on the Bronson, and I believe we just did, like, janitorial work around the course rooms. Clean the bathrooms, that's for sure. I do remember doing that. Changed out garbage. Just anything that needed to be done. All right. Yeah. So, sounds like a lot of menial work. Correct, yeah. And then, like, yeah, the units would break it down as to what you would do. Okay. And then in terms of the construction work, it sounded like pulling up carpet and stuff so it was more of a deconstruction phase I guess yes yeah so pulling up carpet um stupid popcorn on the ceiling having to like and they didn't have like a water source so you had to get like a bucket and throw it up there and then scrape it down um yeah things like that okay yeah and um and then then we'd have breakfast uh -huh. um I believe that was maybe 20 minutes long it was very quick 
Um, and then we had to run off and do uh, more work, whatever we were assigned to do, um, until like noon or something, until lunch. And then we had lunch. And then we went to course um, and worked on that. And then after course... And that was a five-hour stint? Correct, I believe, yeah. Okay, and that's basically in a Scientology course room, you're studying your course. Everybody's right. not on the same course. Right. They're on different courses. And you have a check sheet yes. that tells you item one, read this. Item two, yeah. do a little practical assignment or write a little essay or something. And then number three, read the next thing. Right. And you're and supposed you to go through this at your own pace. And when you finish the check sheet, you have finished the course. Right. Okay. And then there's, um, what were those called? Where they look for an MU, misunderstood word. Uh, yeah. If you're not fast flow, you have to get them. Oh, the checkouts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have to get a, what's called a star rate checkout. Yeah. If there's a little asterisk by the thing you're reading. That's right. Thank then you. Somebody then you else, have to. Yeah. What, what, tell me, talk about that. So you're reading this mind numbingly boring book, might I add. And um, so. Um, L. Ron Hubbard came up with all these study tech ideas and um, one of them was that a misunderstood word is a very bad thing to have. If you don't understand a word, it can cause you to like, be angry and leave like, or they call it blow, but that's like departure, um, an unexpected departure from like, so you would just like leave the Sea Org. Or uh, I guess, do you remember any other for the MU? Uh, you mean like getting tired? Tired, yes. Getting what you're reading. Yes, all that stuff. Right. So, MU is misunderstood word is a bad, bad thing to have in Scientology. So, um, you're reading this horribly boring book, and you have to make sure that you understand every single word, including like is and a ah and the, um, and all the other big stupid words that LRH decided to throw in there. Um, and then somebody, when you get to the asterisk on the check sheet, then you have to tell your course supervisor and then they'll get you a twin, somebody else who will take the material from you um, and, be, and then just quiz you on what words mean. And if you get them wrong, they say flunk and you have to go back to the beginning of the chapter or was it the, I don't remember, the beginning of something, the beginning of what you were reading and do it all over again and find all the MUs or maybe it was back to where you've had the misunderstood word. I think that's it. Um, so, um, yeah, that's what that was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So how many courses did you finish? Um, so I did a total of five while I was on the EPF. Um, the first I did was learning how to learn. Um, took me forever to learn how to learn. Um, <laughs> and I actually was really grateful because when we were at lunch, you said to think about why it took me so long because I felt like such an idiot not being able to get through it. And the more I thought about it, um, I, that was my only time to decompress. I w and I did not, like, I was so out of my element. Like, I had done a couple of courses before. I did the communication and grammar course before. Um, and uh, so it just, I would just sit there and stare, like, at my book. Like, I just was so out of my element. And every time I tried to move forward, like, nobody was nice. Like, you tried to get help. No, figure it out or blah, 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 blah. Or like, I don't know, just nobody was nice. Nobody was helpful. And that's just the whole culture, the whole um, atmosphere that is cultivated there. Um, and so I just took forever, took forever. And then I think finally I was, like I made a little bit of groundwork. Like I decided to actually try and then once I started to actually try, then I was able to get through it and then move on to the other courses. Okay. Yeah. Did anybody ever check with you during this these months that you were on there as to just kind of pull you aside and ask, how, how's it going? How are you doing? No. No. The only time that ever happened is um, I did have a couple emotional breakdowns because I was sad. Um, I guess I cried. That would be my equivalent of emotional breakdown. More? Yeah. Um, and for the most part, that was ridiculed. That was like, you know, no case on post. And like, you, why are you feeling this way? Like, this is stupid. Why are you crying? Oh, my God, you're crying. Like, um, but I do remember one incident where actually Annie Norlin, um, she was a reg 
at the um, at CC. And she had probably rigged my mom out of all that money, but she was very nice to me. Um, and I remember her pulling me aside and like just talking me through it. And that, I really appreciate that. I still remember that. Like it wasn't, there was not met with condemnation, with hate, but just understanding and like, yeah, I could see why this would be a hard situation for you. And, and that really helped. But other than that, no. Wow. Yeah. And like I got, um, since I was 13, they did let me call my mom more than other people did get to call their mom. So I believe it was, I don't remember how frequent it was. It was, it was pretty frequent while I was able to call her. Um, but that first night that I went to go call her, um, they take me down to the CC phone booth and it's actually really kind of a cute little area. There's two phone booths inside this little area and it's got like an old phone booth looking door. Like it's, some European thing, European phone booth. And um, I had a calling card and I go, I'm like, great. And I go to sit down and call my mom and the sea member who escorted me down. And it may have been the EPFIC, um, the person in charge of the state's project force, or it could have been another sea org member. I don't recall, but they stood in the door and I remember I was sitting down and just, it felt very intimidating. Um, but just him standing in the door like this and being like, oh, and just so you know, there are people listening to um, the phone call, people listening from CC, listening to the all the phone calls out on these lines. So if you tell your mom anything that's going on, if you tell her anything negative, anything bad, then we're going to know. It might not have been that ominous, but years later, that's how I remember it. But that's absolutely what was said, that we listen to the phone calls. We will know if you t say that anything's going wrong and you were not allowed to say that. Um, you don't want to upset your mother, do you? Okay. And yeah, so like immediately it was like, well, I, I can't do anything. I can't tell my mom. I can't, you know, like it's very much set up from the start. Like we control you. This is, they, they know how to do it. They've got the techniques down. And I'm like this doofy little 13 year old. Like, so I'm so susceptible to all of it. And right. Yeah. All right. So Yeah. I mean, pretty standard, horrifying Scientology experience for yeah. a teen. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about that in terms of the difference between a, an adult who has informed consent and mm -hmm. who knows what, you know, has some idea of what life is and what life experience is and gets into something like that, knowing what they're getting into. Right. And coercing a 13-year-old into it. Yeah. And I think that's my biggest problem right now with what you're telling me is how to absolutely disgusting this is for yeah you know to treat children this way i i agree okay it is unpleasant <laughs> yeah to say the least yes so for sure. um so every monday we um i had to go work on this ship so it was um they were non-scientologists um and i don't know how they got roped into all this but um so it was it's a Going, it was in Long Beach, just one ship that we would go to. Every Monday, we'd work together at the EPF to see what it was like to be on a working ship. Because, you know, the Sea Org started on a ship, so we're going to go work on this damn ship. And um, it was awful. Like, I just remember hating it. First of all, the food we would bring would be, like, really weird bologna and, like, really white bread, but nothing else. And then non-salted peanuts. Very not a good combination. And I remember like being starving because I'm 13. I'm working all day on this stupid ship and um, just the food. My hands are so greasy and like you can see the grease on the white bread and like there was no way to clean up. And we just had to be grateful that we had food. And I guess I was, but it was so gross. Like to this day, the thought of that combination and the smell like just makes me want to vomit like... Okay, this is completely new to me. Oh, you well, went out to a boat? To a boat, in yes. In Long Beach. Correct. You can see worked, the Queen Mary from there. And worked on the boat. On the boat. Like like you did repairs to the boat? Right, so we did, um, like we would like dig the old, like between the, the boards, dig out the, the stuff they had in the middle, like the caulking, and then we would stick new ropes in there and like retar it and clean the disgusting galley like so there was a captain and a bozeman and they were both on the the ship and they were i'm sure informed to be dicks to us because they were it's like we were just peons there to work on their ship and these were not scientologists they were not scientologists no what yeah 
I know. When you think about it, that's weird. Did the Sea Org own the boat? No. So... Th I think they just... I, from my understanding, it was just some people, they were like, hey, do you want some free work? And yeah. Okay. And then, How yeah. How many of you went out there? I believe the whole EPF went out there. So about 20 we people. Yeah. And this was a yacht or a bigger no, boat? No, no, no. It was, it was not a yacht. It was a sailboat. It was pretty big. I mean... And, was, and sailboat. Sailboat, correct. We actually ended up taking it out a couple times and like learned how to navigate, sort of. Um, and I got so, so seasick. Yeah, it was not... I do not have fond memories of that boat. Huh. Yeah. Okay. That, I've never heard of that before. Really? Not in a long time. Yeah. Not in a long time. In the early 70s, there was a training vessel, quote unquote, that they had out <laughs> at the harbor. And they ended up selling it off. And the EPFers would go out there and do that. Right. But Weird. this was something new. We never did this in uh, PAC over in the Big Blue. Yeah. Where I was doing this Interesting. stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, I did not like the boat. And then, like, just, like, the Bozeman and the captain, they were just so, so jerky. Like, if you didn't do anything, you had to do everything correct, and, and if you didn't, you would get chewed out. Like, and now thinking about it, that's kind of sick on their part. Like, they're not Scientologists. They're just giving these people to treat poorly, and they're like, great, thanks. And they, they rolled with it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. How else did you, what else happened on your EPF? Um, what else happened on my EPF? Oh my God, Battlefield Earth. Okay. Yeah. So bad, So you were on the EPF when Battlefield Earth came out? Correct, correct. So when it was in the theaters, um, they forced us all to go. They rented these huge buses. We went down to some theater in Hollywood and... And how, how were you able to afford to go? You weren't even being paid. I wasn't. Very good question, Chris. Um, <laughs> I, um, should I tell that story first? Sure. Okay. So we're, we're going to back up a bit. Okay. From who I got the money from. Oh, right. Yes. Yes. Let's go ahead and talk about that story okay. first. Okay. Okay. Um, so one day, one morning, um, on the EPF, I was actually the IC, the in charge of the, the unit. I can't remember which unit it was. Um, and, um, I was working over, um, you know, the pavilion, um, in the pavilion bathrooms. So they're out, outside of Celebrity Center, but on the same property, they have this beautiful, I don't know, is it a gl glass building, basically? Yeah. Um, where they do big events and stuff like that. And then they have those outside restrooms for people who are at galas and stuff like that. They can use the restrooms. And so one of our jobs was, you know, to pick up all the trash, clean those bathrooms and, and all that stuff. And so um, I was in the bathroom in the thick of the fury, like just a frenzy, trying to get everything done, moving as fast as I could. Do not leave a single speck of anything anywhere because you're going to get in big trouble. You're just scum of the earth if you do that. And um, I was focusing on that, and I was in the back stall of the bathroom. And um, oh, a fellow EPFer, who's about 40 years old, I want to say, um, at least six foot three. He was, he was a very big man. Um, he comes in. I hear the door open and it close. And I look and I see that it's him. And I was like, what, 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 what's up? What do you need? And he's like, um, I need to tell you something. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then he starts getting closer and closer and closer to me as he's like, I'm, I'm in love with you and I want to have sex with you. And I was like, what? Like, it was not what I was expecting to hear. <laughs> um, and he just came at me. And as he's closing in on me, I duck underneath his arm and run out of the bathroom. So luckily nothing happened, um, but it was very close to something happening. Um, and um, you know, it's sick because the thing that I was worried about in that moment, I wasn't worried about getting raped or molested. I was worried about getting in trouble for having a sexual relationship with somebody because in the Sea Org, you can only have sex when you're married. Um, any, any other stuff is like big trouble. It's bad. 
you don't do it. And that was really drilled into me. Um, and so that was my concern was that I was going to get in trouble for this guy doing this to me. Um, so I was very shaken up, uh, very scared. And I ran and went to the reception and I had the EPFIC page. Um, cause I was like, he's going to want to know about this. You know, like you're not supposed to have sex when you're on the EPF and when you're not married. And so like, I thought for sure he would come down and be like, yeah, you're right, Kat. This is bad. This is terrible. And, and take care of the situation. Um, and I told the receptionist, like, this is an emergency. Like, I was really shooken up about it. Um, and 15 minutes passed, 20 minutes passed. The EPFIC didn't come, didn't show. So I'm like, can you page him again? I, and I, I'm also sitting down on the job waiting for him. And that is so against the rules. You're supposed to run everywhere you go. You're not supposed to relax and decompress. That's against the rules. Um, and so I was so scared that I was going to get in trouble for not working, but I knew I did not want to go back to working with that gentleman. Um, and I was just hoping the EPF I see would show up and help me with the situation. Um, I don't believe he ever showed. If he did, no, he did show up. That's right. Many pages later. And I told him, and he could have cared less. He was like, this is why you called me up here. Like, he was not at all concerned about anything that had just happened. Sent me back to, to you work. You explained to him exactly what you just said to yeah. me. And he no. just, no, what's, what's the problem? Yeah, he was just like, oh, God, yeah, it's fine. We'll take care of it. But he, they didn't take care of it. They, he just said that to placate me in the moment and to send me back. Um, Whoa. Yeah. And he's still in the EPF with me. Luckily, he did not try anything else. Okay. That was the only only incident with that. Do you know if anybody ever talked to him, or did I, he? Just... I feel like he may have gone in session because of it. Okay. Um, which is a really way weird way to handle that, but. Well, they might have, have taken him in for a little uh, ethics interview. Oh, or, okay. Which is sort of a light form of a security check. Oh, okay. To see what it was that he did exactly. The fact that he remained there after that is what most disturbs me. Yeah. Because regardless of what they did to find out what he was up to, if he had done that, that is clearly predatory behavior. Right. And, you know, 40-something years old, you're clearly a minor. Right, right. So it says something that he, regardless of what internal punishment he received, this is somebody right. who's exhibiting predatory that's good, behavior that's a really good point yeah so yeah. it's pretty off the rails that yeah. he was still anywhere around you yeah or other teens because half the right were right teens. exactly half the sea org was teens like i mean wow probably not half the sea org but a lot of teens were in the sea org very young people yes yeah, yeah. celebrity center is packed with young people mm -hmm. i think the average age there is probably 23 wow I mean, you have these old farts. You yeah, know, the there were some really too. old smokers, and I'm like, really? How are you still hanging on? Right. I mean, good for them, but... Yeah, not a lot of people in the middle. Yeah. So, okay, so that happened. No follow-up with you? Correct. It was just that, that, that you was, reported it? That, that was, was it. it. That was it. Okay, was he still in your unit after that? He may have been moved out of my unit. I think he was. Okay. So I only saw him at musters and course and mealtime. Okay. Yeah. So basically the sum total of, of the handling done on that is to put him in somebody else's room. Right. Put a predator in so he can prey on somebody else. Right. Who's not as jumpy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So we're just going to mark that as exhibit A and okay. kind of move on through the EPF here. Okay. But that's obviously monstrously disturbing. Right. So... Then you mentioned Battlefield Earth came around. Correct. So how I got money for ba Battlefield Earth. So this guy just keeps on throwing on the torture because if I didn't get money from him, I would not have had to go. But um, so everybody was required to go, but you had to pay for it on your own. Um, and I was like, well, I, I don't have any money. I have no income. Like there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and he actually overheard me talking, um, saying I couldn't go. And it was a very weird exchange. She's like, oh, do you need some money? I was like, uh, I guess so. And so he took out money from his pocket and just gave it to me. He's like, here, you can go. And I was like, 
okay, thank you, and I ran off, and it felt very dirty. <laughs> I can totally imagine why. Yeah. Did you have any other interactions with him during the remainder of your time on the appearance? Um, Minor, just passing, whatnot, um, but nothing to what he what had happened. Okay. Nothing else happened, so. He didn't try to give you any other significant looks or corner you or... Right, not that I noticed. Well, cornering I would have noticed, but looks I didn't see. Okay. Yeah. Did you finish the EPF? I did. Okay. Yeah. So you finally graduated. I finally graduated. Seven months. Woo, woo. Yes, yeah, seven months. It's of... supposed to be a three-week program. I know. Actually, I think a two-week program. That's what they told me, too. Yeah. Liars. Liars. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it did not happen. <laughs> okay. So what happened when you graduated? Uh, so when I graduated... Um, so I was recruited into Senior HCO, and I was actually really excited about that because I really liked the Class A uniform. Such a nerd. And like that was really exciting to me, like oh, how official would I look in a Class A uniform? Right, which is the uniform that looks most like a Navy dress uniform. Right, with that little weird bow tie thing, and I was so excited about it. But first, um, since I was, I think I was 14. I turned 14 while I was on the EPF. So when I graduated, I was 14. Um, they said I had to go to school and get my GED, not go to school, but you know, the state of California was like, we need these minors to be educated. And they're like, well, okay, we'll have a little work around. So I went to this um, Scientology school. I don't remember what it was called. Me and this other, I think this guy was 15 who went with me. Um, his name was Arthur. And um, he, uh, we went there and, um, she was supposed to help us with our GED. That's what they were told. So help us get our GED. And basically she gave us the big old GED book and was just like, here, figure it out. Like she was so, I, I bet you she got saddled with so many Sea Org kids needing to get their GED that she was just done. Like she was not nice. She was not happy. I tried to ask her one question and she made it very clear to not do that. And I just was like, oh, all right. It's like learning how to learn all over again. I'm just stuck here with this giant book trying to figure it out. And so I did put a, an effort into to reading and learning, um, but then I found out that the answers are right there in the back of the book. So I took the test with the answer key and... Oh my. Yeah. Had there been any effort during those seven months that you were on the EPF to get you any schooling? Oh, no. Okay. No. Do you know if you're, when you signed for the Sea Org, was schooling discussed in any way? No. Okay, so no. there weren't promises made. No, no, there, there definitely wasn't. Okay. Um, but actually, that just reminds me of something that happened on the EPF. Oh, tell me. Yeah. Um, so while I was on the EPF, um, one way that I deal with stress <laughs> and trauma is I don't eat. My stomach just is like an iron thing, iron thing that doesn't let food in. And um, I... Uh, so I wasn't able to eat. So I'm running around working, very stressed out. Um, I dropped a lot of weight and was, yeah, just really stressed out. And I actually stopped getting my period while I was there, which is good because I didn't have money to buy sanitary napkins. So, I mean, I guess that helped there. But it completely stopped for the whole time I was there. I did not get it. Um, okay. And so I was dropping a lot of weight. I was really struggling with this eating thing. Um, Again, I was just so stressed out all mm -hmm. the time. And so I um, thought, well, you know what? We have this great resource. We have Scientology that can cure everybody of everything. I'm going to see if I can get some help. And so I told um, a person who I was um, on the EPF with. His name was Eli Elliot, something like that. I had a crush on him. Anyway, I told him that um, I... Uh, you know, I couldn't eat and I was just having this problem like, and I needed help. Like I just, I needed help. And I knew that this was not something I could handle on my own. Um, I was physically feeling the effects um, of the stress. Um, and so he, he wrote a knowledge report on me, a care on me. And um, I was like, great, well, hopefully that means that they'll be like, oh, okay, so we need to do this auditing action or whatever, just, just to help, or maybe we could, I don't know, help in any way, any way, shape, or form would have been better than what happened. Um, so they 
um, soon after this one guy came up to me and I didn't know him. He's a steward member, but I'd never met him before. And he's like, come with me. And I was like, oh, okay. So I go into his office again, hoping that he's going to be like, well, here's how we're going to handle this. Um, no, that's not what happened. He sat on the desk. So, you know, I'm sitting here the desk is right here. He's sitting on the desk and he's like, so you're not eating? I was like, well, yeah. And I try, I tried to explain to him why I was just really stressed out. It was just, I was just going through a hard time and I just needed help. And he's like, oh, well, if you don't start eating, then we're going to have to have a Sea Org member come sit down beside you and make sure that you eat just like you're a baby. Is that what you want? I was like, well, no, that sounds actually quite awful, sir. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then that was it. And I went on not being able to eat. I mean, obviously I had enough to survive because I didn't die, but um, no period, no nothing for the whole the rest of the time I was there, it never came because my wow. body was just in so much stress and like survival mode. And you done you'd never seen this guy before. You don't know who he was. Correct. Just some random just sea some guy. Some random dude. So let's get back to you finishing the EPF. Okay. So you wanted to go to senior HCO. Yeah. Get the awesome, cool class A uniforms. Yeah. And what happened? Um, so then I had to go to school. Right. Right. Get my GED. Um, went for a week or two, and that's when. I was like, I'm just going to copy the answer key on the back, because um, why not? Um, and then I brought it to the teacher, and I was like, here, I finished it. And she was like, really? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, okay. And then that was it. And then I never went back. I don't know if it got sent in to the GED people or... Oh, no one ever told you whether you got nope. your GED or not? Nope. All right. It was just all a formality. Um, so that took a couple of weeks, and then... Um, I finally got my Class A uniform. It's very exciting. But I only got one, which is very difficult to try to keep something clean when you only have one of them, and that is what you have to wear. And it's a white, stupid shirt. Um, and it was too big. It was awkward. Like, it was not the glamour uniform I thought it was going to be. It was very disappointing. But, mm. uh, yeah. And so I didn't have a change of clothes. And I believe you had to pay for dry cleaning. CC? Yeah. So I didn't have any money. Even if I did have a chance, I didn't have any money to try to um, get it dry clean. So I just had this shirt that I was stuck wearing. Um, I'm sure I smelled. I'm sure it was terrible. Um, and actually, I remember there was this one time I was in the mess hall and um, just hanging out with my Sea Org buddies and one who loved ketchup, big bowl of ketchup. And I bet you can see where the story is going. Big bowl of ketchup, we're goofing around, and my arm goes right in to the ketchup. And talk about panic. Oh my god. I, I I'm sure I turned white. I ran across the street to my room, took it off, and was just in the sink, scrubbing it with soap, trying to get that out. And just like I may have even been crying. Like it was so like devastating because I had no other shirt and you had to look perfect. Like that was the options. And so um, and then I had to be at muster because I was following dinner and I had to put on this wet shirt that I just washed in the sink to get the ketchup out. Yeah. And in seven months now, eight months, I suppose, yeah. now we're talking about, not one person ever did anything to get you your social security number. No, no, no. So you could get paid. No. Just no one cared. No one cared. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, even the whole time that I was in PAC, and there was a lot of awful things about PAC. I never knew how bad it was over at CC. Yeah. We always had this idea that CC had it better and CC so was glamorous. nicer yeah. or something. And no. No. The more I've learned since I left the Sea Org, the more I learned that it was actually a hellhole over there. Yeah. Pretty much sucked. Every single person I've talked to, I've talked to quite about four or five people who used to be CC staff. Yeah. And That's it's just, of every those. one of them is just like, they could give a shit about their staff. Over oh there. yeah, no, they just did not care. You were care. a number and you knew it. Like wow. you perform and if you don't, they'll be sure to come after you if you don't. But mm -hmm. yeah. So how much longer did you last? Um, I think a month longer. I was an expediter for senior HCO. Um, it was just one day I woke up and I was like, oh my God, I don't want to do this anymore. And um, there was this one woman I had been talking to who was there. Um, I believe her name was Ava. Um, and I told her, like, 
I can't do this anymore. And so she was like, okay. Um, and so then I was put on decks and started that whole process of rounding out. And what, what was that process for you? Um, so sec check, heavy sec checking. Um, so it was like an interrogation. Um, using the e-meter. Using the e-meter, right. Because they believe that, you know, the only reason why you would leave Scientology is because of your overts and withholds, bad things that you've done. So they're just so benevolent and they want to help you even in your leaving of the church so that they'll ask all these questions lots and lots of questions um, and see if it reads on the meter and um, basically to get dirt on you is my understanding of it after I've left is that they have because they ask you some pretty crazy questions like I was asked if I had ever fucked a dog or um, you were actually asked that maybe not fucked but slept with a dog yeah really yep okay 14 years old yep that's yeah. awesome it was it was pretty cool um, and then um Another question, like, because she wasn't getting anything on me. I was 14. Like, I didn't have any crimes against the church. You know, I had never slept with a dog, believe it or not. So there was just nothing that was reading. <laughs> um, and uh, so she started, like, digging really deep and was like, um, are, are you having sex with your roommates? Are you guys having lesbian sex? And I was like, oh, my God, no. And she's like, or do you get dildos out and pleasure each other? It's like... No, no, like, I, what, what is happening here? And, like, just a number of questions like that that were just to that level. Um, and then once I got out of that session, I told... So when you're on decks, they have security guards on you 24-7. Um, so waiting outside the auditing room was my security guard so that I couldn't just leave. Where was I going to go? I had no money. I was 14. I was in a different country. I was fine. <laughs> I was not at risk of leaving. Um... So I remember going out and the security guard was there and I remember being like just so disturbed by it um, and being like, she asked me this, is that okay? And he's like, I don't know, I'll look into it. And then he got some policy where L. Ron Hubbard's like, if, you, if nothing's reading during a sec check, it's okay to make up your own crazy things. I mean, obviously that's not how he said it, but it was like, you're allowed to just ask crazy things until you find what the crime is or the hidden withhold. And Right. But it was very like, I was very not happy with that. It felt very violating. Right. Yeah. Asking a 14-year-old about lesbian sex and dildos is disgusting. Yeah. It was so, so uncomfortable. I was, yeah. Completely inappropriate. Right. And then you're the one to make, like, you're the one that's wrong. Like, for feeling gross about it, like, you're the one that's wrong. And that's right. Totally into victim shaming there. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. All right. Well, you finished that security check. Correct. And then what happened? Um, and you know what? And for years, I was like, the church is so great because they paid for my ticket home. <laughs> In hindsight, maybe not so much. But um, and actually, my guardian, my like, like this was like the biggest encounter I had with her. They actually had her fly me home. Um, she flew with you. Flew with me home to Calgary and then flew back on to LA. Okay. Yeah. Interesting that they did that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by, like, what the thought process was. Probably because I was a minor. Probably. Well, and I remember, because, you know, when you're in the Sea Org, you're treated like you're an adult. Like, you, again, your your body is 13, but your mind and everything is billions of years old. Um, and so, actually, after I finished up the EPF, I went home for a little while. I was able to go home and get my stuff. That's when I was able to get it. Um and I had to do a sec check for that. And, of course, it was, like, up to the very minute we had to leave. And it was super stressful. Um, but I was able to go home. And um, I remember getting off the plane in Calgary. And this one lady's like, are you the 13-year-old flying alone? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, oh, do you need help? And I was like, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Like, it was so weird to me that she was so concerned about my age and, and me flying alone. Like, because I was not used to that. Like... So what happened after you, they, they sent you back home? Mm -hmm. What'd your mom say? She didn't say too much about it, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, she was pretty present, or absent from our lives. She was there, but she didn't handle my dad's death well. So she was into men, and, and we were a burden to her. Oh. Yeah, sadly. So she didn't, she didn't say much about it, um, and I didn't tell her much about it. All right. Yeah. So she never learned of what happened with the 40-plus guy. Right. 
Right. I had, I tried to talk to her about it um, a couple years back because I, like, stored it away. Like, I, in my head, I was the one that failed. I was the one that couldn't complete the Sea Org. I let mankind down, you know. So I, I didn't let myself think about it too much because I was still very programmed at that point. Oh, so when you got home, you didn't feel like you'd had uh, some relief from an escape from something horrible. You were blaming right. yourself for the whole thing. Right. Oh, all right. Yeah, and so, yeah. And, yeah, and then things were just harder at home, and so, it, yeah, it was not a relief to go home. I mean, I didn't have a cult there driving me, so that was good. But. Right. Now, your other siblings had not gotten involved in Scientology, is that right? Um, they've all had, like, dipped a toe into Scientology. Um, well, had any of them gone with your mom on any more of her trips? Not anymore. So just my brother went and did the Purif that second time we were there. Um, and then when we were in Canada, actually, my mom had a boyfriend who was very anti-Scientology. And so she actually looked to leave the church and all that stuff because of him, because he was saying it was a cult. Um, so she really wasn't involved in Scientology after I got back. Um, I don't believe she made any more trips back to L.A. Um, I could be wrong about that, but okay. she was really like, I'm going to look into Scientology, and it could be a cult and, oh. and all that stuff. Um, and it wasn't until we moved to the States, to Colorado, so that was 15 when we moved here, um, yeah, that immediately she got on lines at the Denver Org and um, got on staff pretty soon after that. So we still had Scientology very much present in our lives uh, by the time okay. we got here. Um, and then um, she had broken up with that boyfriend at that point, and so she was now back to being a, a Scientologist in good standing. So. Okay. And she's still a single mom raising you guys. Correct. And a staff member at Denver. Oh, yeah. Staff member and, yeah. How was she making any money? She wasn't. She did odd jobs here and there. We did own a cleaning business at one point. And that was the um, only time I can remember in those years that we had a lot of food in our house. Like, there was days where there wasn't food. Um, I started working uh, right when we moved here, and I helped pay for things. Um, and... Yeah, she did odd jobs. She never did anything substantial to, to really um, make an income. Huh. And she worked for the org. She worked for Ability Plus. That was a school here in Denver. Um, my brother, my youngest brother, actually went there um, for his middle school, I believe. Okay. Something like that. Um, that school's not open anymore. Correct. No, they closed that down. Okay. Um. And uh, so she worked for them, and I think she got a little bit of money for that, and um, got he got free tuition to go there. Um, but I helped her out a lot, a lot, and I think my other siblings did. And then, like I said, she had a cleaning business, which she bought from a Scientologist, and that was, like, the most money that we'd ever had. Like, we had food on the table every night, and that was great, but we had to work for her. Um, and she couldn't pay us, obviously. Um, and so I had, at that point in time, had two different jobs and then was helping her after that. And then um, one of my other brothers, he was working another job and then working pretty much full time for her as well. So. All right. When you Very came... big group effort. <laughs> All right. When you got back, did you go back to school? Yeah. So I started ninth grade. Um, I wasn't going to. It felt weird going back to all of that. Um, I was just going to do a, um online school. But my friend talked me into going back, so I ended up going back to school. Good. And yeah. you finished, ended up finishing high school? No. Okay, what no. happened? Um, I did drop out. <laughs> um, I just, like, I take responsibility for my actions in this, too. But also there was no boundaries in our home. You didn't have to go to school. You didn't have to try. There was no, um, um, accountability, none of that. So I just, I tried for a little while and did well. And then I realized it didn't matter. And so then I just started skipping school, I started working more. So I would skip school to go to work. Um, and then a couple 
months before, or weeks before I was supposed to graduate. At that point in time, like, there was, I wasn't going to be able to graduate, so I just dropped out. I didn't have enough credits, so huh. I dropped out. I want to I wanted differentiate or, or understand where your mom is coming from. Your father was around. I imagine he was a little bit of a disciplinarian or at least wanted order in the family. Right. And we were Mormon, so right. there was definite, like... Go to school, yeah. do your chores, do your stuff. Mm -hmm. So when he dropped off the map, so to speak, is that when everything kind of went to hell? Oh, yeah. Or Okay. For sure. So it's not necessarily a Scientology thing that that happened. Right. I think more so it's, yeah, my mother was not, and I and I can sympathize with her to a point, um, was not equipped or prepared, and I don't know who would be, to be a single mother of six. Like, that's a big, big order. Oh, yeah. Um, and she had her own stuff going on, and um, I think that she was just the perfect person for Scientology. Like, she needs someone to tell her what to do, and that's that's Scientology. Well, I find it so in, so shameful, really, that she gets involved in Scientology, even on a part-time basis, mm -hmm. then moves here. Yes, a single mother of six children yeah. is a very tall order. Right. It is an, 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 an order of magnitude beyond right. anything I could imagine as far as the right. responsibility level, uh, you know, overseeing the development of six kids. Yeah. And yet... Scientology recruits her to join staff, pays her nothing, yep. is not really doing anything to address the ethics of her not dealing with that well right. or dealing with her children. So I kind of go, well, Scientology may not have hurt that or made it worse directly. But on the other hand, all this nonsense of Scientology believes in strong families and val oh, values God, and bullshit. ethics. and yes. They they do not care. That's a to make you think that the church is great, but it is not. They do not care right. about yeah. You know, your mother could basically get away with yeah being that irresponsible as a Scientologist. Right. Very you know, good point. Yeah, it didn't it didn't help yeah. at all. No. Oh, it sure did not. Ugh. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I didn't know most of this going yeah. into this conversation with you. So yeah. Uh, fair enough. So then you uh, grew up. I did. You now have a family. You I do. Are doing your life. Yep. How is mom now? Still, still working for the church. She is an auditor at the the Denver org. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. She's the the nighttime auditor there. The nighttime auditor. The nighttime the only auditor. One. Yes. And Denver is an ideal org. Yes. It's very so beautiful it's building. Be, <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to be perfect. Yeah. It's supposed to be a wonderful place. Do you talk to her? Do you see her? I don't talk to her anymore. Um, just with the way things were, and um, I was the one that said, I need some time and some space to be able to heal and to get get through this. So I haven't talked to her um, in about two years, and now it will be indefinite because of this mm -hmm. and this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what does that say? This is the essence of tyranny. And that's the Sea Org symbol. Yes, it is. Yeah. I definitely got that. It's like almost like a protection for myself, too, because they're not going to let me, they're not going to come after me, try to get me on lines again, because I've got this. Right. Yeah. You could just send them a screenshot or a picture. Yeah. I think <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Tracking on that. Uh, okay. So, well, thank you very much for... Thank you. I appreciate the, the platform I, and I appreciate what you do. I really do. I, I listen to a lot of it and it helps me. Like I said, like I don't have the community to, to talk with these things. So to... And I feel like we're very like-minded on a lot of our ideas and stuff like that. So I appreciate what you do and I thank you for it. So, Ab absolutely. Yeah. It's not a problem. It's... It's a very brave thing that you're doing right now Thank to, you. yeah, to do this. And I want to, I want to make sure you know that. Thanks. Yeah. I'm trying to, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a big deal. Yeah. And, uh, and I know that you're making sacrifices doing this because yeah. like you said, your, your relationship with your mom is definitely going to be different. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know about the rest of your family, but we don't need to get into that right now. Right. But yeah, you know, it's kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. And that's also another reason why to speak out. It's like you've got these, they've got these um, 
things in place to control people. And it's like, well, if you speak out, and I'm not saying things that are untrue. This happened to me. This was my time in Scientology. But now I'm against Scientology. So I'm an SP and it doesn't matter what I said. It doesn't matter the things that happened. All that matters is that I would say something negative about the church in such a public way. Well, that's exactly right. If you're yeah. waiting for an apology from Scientology, you'll be waiting forever. Oh, yeah. Boat has sailed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Well, I guess we'll wrap up now. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.